Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. So in this video we're going to talk all about the company Neuralink and what they are planning to do, what they are currently doing and how they're going to achieve this. And so in particular we're going to be talking about their brain machine interface and what this device can do and what developments are needed to further improve the system and to improve the safety because there's a lot of risk associated with this technology. But there is a lot of excitement surrounding this technology because it has the potential to treat a number of diseases from Parkinson's disease to epilepsy to depression. And so we'll try and discuss all of these different features in this video. So firstly, that's just a bit of background about Neuralink, the company itself. So it's a neurotechnology company and it was founded back in 2016 by Elon Musk and others. And they, as I said, are developing an implantable brain machine interface. So there is quite a lot to cover in this video, but to broadly split it down, firstly we're going to focus on what are their main goals. So to help prepare for this video, I watched the full video of the Neuralink launch event and also read the recent publication that Elon Musk published last year that goes into more detail about the technology of this implantable device. And so I've tried to summarise both of these features into this video. And you'll find the link to both of these sources in the description. So as I said, we're going to look at Neuralink's goals, look at why they're doing it, how they're doing it, and then where they're currently at, and their future plans and clinical trials. But first, we need to have a little bit of the basics to neurons before we go any further. So I will try and keep this explanation as simple as possible. So what I've drawn out here is a neuron. So this is a very generic looking neuron. And so what neurons do is they pass on signals and they do this in one singular direction. And then at the end of the neuron, it can then, for a chemical signal, pass on the signal to the next neuron. And so this is the process of neurotransmission. So besides these chemical signals, when it goes through the neuron itself, it has an electrical signal. And you can recall these electrical signals to see if a neuron is active. So these neural signals are often also referred to as nerve impulses or action potentials or spikes due to the, the trace that they give if you measure the voltage across the membrane of these neurons. So during one of these spikes, you see the membrane potential become positive and the voltage go up. And so this happens because of the changes in flux between the ions across the membrane of the neuron. So when the neuron becomes stimulated, you see an increase in positive ions flow into the inside of the neuron, and this is what causes the increase in the voltage. And then once this increase occurs, there's then a secondary response to close this channel to prevent any more ions coming in, and a different channel opens that allows different positive ions to leave the neuron. And the point to take from this is that there's electrical changes across the membrane of the neuron due to these movements of ions. And these are what can be detected and recorded to understand which neurons are active. So our brains have around 100 billion neurons. So that's a lot of information that we've got in our brain. And this information isn't just which neurons are active or inactive. It also depends on the frequency of these spikes and also their timing. However, perturbations in neuronal signalling can cause a variety of different disorders such as epilepsy, depression and Parkinson's disease. And so one of the motivations behind Neuralink is to be able to understand and treat these different brain disorders. And also potentially at some point a longer term future goal is to preserve and enhance your own brain. And all in all it's to create a well aligned future. And as described in their launch meeting, is to have a full brain machine interface and to have a symbiosis with AI instead of it working for us and the fears of it taking over. So the mechanism by which Neuralink want to treat these disorders is through a brain machine interface. So what exactly does that mean? So apologies for the terrible drawing of a brain, but what this means is that initially you need to be able to detect these electrical signals, these spikes that come from the different neurons. And then you need to be able to interpret these signals and understand what it means. And then using that information, you could then feed back into the brain and stimulate different neurons. And so this could work either by taking the information to the outside world or by having a direct in vivo feedback system. So how many neurons would you have to detect to be able to interpret the signal? Well, as many as possible. Studies have shown that the 
greater the number of neurons that can be recorded, the, be the better the predictions are. And so that helps to alleviate the problem that neuronal signaling is somewhat stochastic. So by having more neurons, the predictions can be better. So the last step of these brain machine interfaces is the feedback to the brain. And so this is part of the field of neuromodulation. And what this simply means is being able to regulate disordered neural activity. And it's actually a fast growing area of medicine. And there's a lot of research in this at the moment. But the big question is how? So there are a lot of emerging technologies that are capable of this, but the approach that Neuralink have taken are implantable technologies. And this requires the combined knowledge of specialists in a variety of different fields, from robotics to materials to biochemistry, hello, to FDA regulation to software development. And so Neuralink have developed a variety of different models and improved upon them each time, but the one that they most recently presented was an N1 sensor. And so the key components to this brain machine interface include threads, robotics, electronics and algorithms. And the three main goals by using this N1 sensor is to be able to increase by orders of magnitude the number of neurons that they can read from and then feedback into in a manner that is safe and long lasting. And then the importance of this is that they could produce devices that serve critical unmet medical needs of patients. And then also they want to make the procedure of integrating this N1 sensor or further development of these sensors in a simple and automated manner, such that it's as simple as having laser eye surgery. So if we look at the first goal first, because it's first, the implantable device must be able to record the electrical signals and they can do that by using electrodes. And so these are what are used to detect the spikes. And so there are around 1,024 electrodes on these devices. And in the future, they hope to have up to 3,072. With each electrode potentially being able to record thousands of neurons. And so the second question is, how do you get these sensors into the patient? So Neuralink's goal is to make the procedure as simple and safe as possible. And this means having no big scars and no long hospital stays. So their current plan is to use only a local anaesthetic whilst they make a small opening in the skin and then a painless opening in the skull. And then the idea is to use a robotic system to have a quick placement of the threads into the cortex. And this is important because the brain actually moves as we breathe and only a robot would be able to get that precision and able to avoid vascular terror in the brain. So as you can see in this figure, you can see that the opening is then filled by the sensor so that the scalp can be closed up. And then you can see how the threads are placed into the brain cortex. And so this procedure would be so simple that you wouldn't have to shave any hair, which is a good thing. But that is not the only incision that needs to be made. To get the information from the electrodes, there also needs to be a small incision behind the ear to insert a coil. And what this coil it does is it's connected to the sensors through these wires. And then the last component is a wearable device that connects wirelessly and is also controlled by an iPhone app. And it's also the outside component that could in theory be modified or upgraded. And it just reminds me of this bit from Doctor Who, niche reference if you're not a Doctor Who fan. Anyway. What is needed to be able to achieve this, if we're going to be realistic about this? Well, firstly, you want it to be completely wireless, which is the approach that they've taken. But secondly, the big challenge is how long will these last in the brain? You need years to decades in terms of a lifetime and biocompatibility with the brain. Another big challenge is having a practical bandwidth. And so bandwidth is the maximum rate of data transfer. And so the idea is to be able to minimise the delay between detecting and then feedbacking into the system. And lastly, in terms of patient's quality of life, you want this approach to be something that can be used at home instead of having to go to the hospital. So development and modification of these devices is an ongoing process at Neuralink, and there are many technical and biological challenges that they face. So on a technical side, the ideal solution would be able to have single spike resolution, so having a single neuron that you're detecting. So you need to get the electrodes as close to the neurons as possible but without causing any damage. And so you need small flexible devices that are biocompatible with the brain. And 
then the system still needs to be functional and it also needs to use materials that are long lasting as well as being biocompatible. And in addition, you want the manufacturing process and the materials that are being used to be scalable so that it has as a futuristic outlook could be applied more globally. So these challenges are more focused on getting the device into the brain and then being able to detect the electrical signals. The second challenge comes from the biological side, which is being able to interpret what the signals mean. And this is where you need algorithms and correct interpretation of uh, the signals. And so one way that they want to do this is firstly by converting these analog spike signals into a digital signal and then use those digital signals to look for patterns. And as one electrode could detect more than one neuron, you need to also be able to identify different neurons that could be combined in the same signal. And so these spikes really are a communication with the brain. And so the idea is to be able to do this and get the feedback in real time. But putting the challenges to one side, with this information, what could you actually do? So one example that I'll explain is the treatment of paralysis. So there's a region in the brain known as the primary motor cortex, and this is where signals are sent down the spinal cord to muscles to drive movement. The problem is this becomes defective in patients with paralysis. But the cool thing is, even just thinking of movement stimulates a similar response to actually performing the movement. So the way that I understand this is that if you have a patient with paralysis and they think about movement, you could use these sensors to detect that information and then feed back into the system to stimulate a part of the, the brain that will then cause the movement or to control movement of assisted robotic devices. And so this could then be extended further to other regions of the brain because the motor cortex, not only does it control arm and hand movements, but it can also control speech. And so in theory, in the future, you could have synthetic speech. And then there's other brain regions beyond that, such as regions involved in regulating mood, pain, hunger, memory, such as the hippocampus, which in theory could also be targeted and used to treat other diseases such as Parkinson's, epilepsy, depression and chronic pain. And so Neuralink envisualised a future where we could see individualised, highly focused treatments. So these are more long-term goals. So where are Neuralink currently at in terms of treatment of diseases? So it was outlined in their launch event that they planned to initiate human clinical trials by the end of 2020. And so the aim for this trial would be to implant four of these N1 sensors and to have three of them in motor areas and one of them in the somatosensory area. And they are planning to do this in patients with quadriplegia, which is those patients who have damage in their spinal cord. So the plan is to record neuronal activity in the M1, SMA and PMD areas of the brain, and then to be able to feed back and stimulate the S1 region. And so if you don't really know what those areas mean, don't need to worry too much, but there's a little map there if you're interested. But the priority number one is the safety of patients. And that's one thing we haven't discussed yet, is what are the risks associated with this technology? Uh, I just realised I should probably say what are the hazards, not what are the risks. But anyway, firstly, the, well, the issues with this is getting the device in the first place into the brain, because there could be damage associated with the integration of the sensors. And if that scars the surrounding tissue, that could cause inflammation, which is known to be linked with diseases such as ageing and Alzheimer's which isn't really what you want to be inducing in the patients. And also there's potential heat emission from the sensors themselves, which could also lead to inflammation and scarring. And then what happens if the device actually malfunctions? You can't just remove them very easily. And then there's the issue of it being able to last a lifetime without eroding and causing potential byproducts in the brain that could also cause inflammation. And then more related to the feedback mechanism and stimulation of neurons, what happens if it becomes uncontrollable and you end up with unwanted and involuntary movements? I don't know why this just reminded me of this bit from Wallace and Gromit, but basically there's a lot of issues and safety hazards that need to be addressed. So it will be interesting to see what happens in the cl clinical trials and then to await the FDA approval. But yeah, there's many problems still to be solved and addressed and it's going to take time. And I just thought I'd mention as well that there are other emerging technologies as well. 
But what is exciting about Neuralink's approach is that they're very much looking far into the future as to where this technology could go. And to leave you on one of their endpoints, their aim is to have better connections to the world, to each other and to ourselves. And so hopefully this video has given you a somewhat overview to Neuralink. Obviously I'm not related to the company in any way, I've just read this online and tried to explain it to you the best that I can. So hopefully you've learned something. If you have something that you'd like to say that I said wrong, let me know. I'm happy to listen and learn as well. And as always, thanks for listening.